Um, I'm just going to do a quick introduction of who Kevin is, and then we'll throw it over to him. But Kevin Hawkins is a product designer and UX research uh, leader. He was born in Washington, D.C., but has lived all over the world. With over 17 years of experience in user experience, product design, and data visualization, he leads multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams of designers and researchers who collaborate with engineers, marketers, customers to deliver intuitive, accessible, and engaging solutions. Before joining Amentis, Kevin was the global UX director at Glovo, a director of product design at Book Club, and the UX team lead at Bookings.com. He's also a seasoned instructor and speaker, having spoken and taught at Growth Tribe, General Assembly, AIGA, Hatch Conference, UXDX, and the list goes on. We're really excited to have Kevin with us today. And with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone can hear me okay. How's it going? So this is a, as Jeff called it, a remix on the talk I gave at Hatch in Berlin a couple of weeks ago. I do a lot of talks mostly on how to kind of take the best practices you see at these really amazing companies, often in London, Silicon Valley, and bring them into your company. So like making them tangible or realistic, and then fitting them for the circumstances you have. That also means fitting them for the stakeholders you have, well, people who sometimes don't want you to be great is how it feels. <laughs> they have feedback, they have limitations, they maybe have mindset differences. And so tackling those challenges when you're presenting new ideas or trying to get new, new work done is all about how you get your buy-in. Uh, so super happy to be here talking to, to you. A huge shout out to, to Hannah for bringing me into the Guild of Working Designers. Okay, cool. So quick disclaimer, it's going to be super light and fun. I'm going to try to get as much audience interaction as possible. It's really helpful if you bring examples or frustrations you have, because then you can directly apply the lessons learned. And so feel free to laugh or, you know, complain. I'd be like, oh, that happens all the time. That's, that's how it's going to feel. All right. So thank you for the introduction. Just like a, a quick disclaimer. So I've been working at a lot of marketplace companies the last couple of years. So Glovo, Booking.com, previously in the States, as you can hear from my accent, as an American. I worked at Uber, PwC, and a lot of like really fun companies that were in FinTech and non-traditional marketplaces. So it's something that I've been trying to use because it's not just the stuff that I learned at Marketplace and big, beautiful, high-funded tech products. It's also worked at nonprofits, NGOs, science companies, fintech, and e-commerce. So I'd like to do a little background so you know who you're talking to. On the left is my mom. I'm originally from West Africa and Liberia. And then my dad and my brother are from Black American and Filipino. I try to use a lot of this information because it's like where I get my skills from. Politics plays a big part of Washington, D.C., which is where I was born. And politics will play a huge part in how you get stakeholders to believe and trust you when you're making decisions. So we're going to take some of that skill set from my background and from the politics of D.C. and turn it into a useful skill set and playbook. First things first, sometimes it feels like it's a very frustrating experience trying to convince someone an obvious decision because it seems obvious to you. So I always say stakeholders, you know, are humans. Uh, they have a certain kind of patterns and themes. You know, they want more, more value from you. They want to get more money. They want to get promotion. They want the company to do well and the area that they are responsible for to be successful. Um, they want to see very clean lines between something they're asked to do, an investment to make, a new feature, and how it's going to increase business or a key performance indicator because this is how they're judged, this is how they're assessed, and this is how their bosses show interest and get funding. And then, of course, you know, show that you care about the users you're trying to, to design for because that generally opens the conversation into a neutral playing field because it's our job to cut the user up a little. At the very least, if you start the conversation, not from a personal opinion, but I think this is best for the user, then we have maybe a good starting point. Let's dive in a little bit into what I call like the environment of trying to influence our stakeholders. Generally, as, as a designer and as a design manager, our roles are always to influence them. So I feel like we're always facilitating workshops, we're walking them through insights and research, you're leading sessions sometimes when there's brainstorming or discovery. Other times you're receiving top down requests and or feature lists. And you are pushing back to try to get them to build the best thing or the, to build things correctly. And so the last company where I've been able to really see this through end to end is Glovo. If you're unfamiliar, Glovo is owned by Delivery Hero, which is German. 
but we're in 34 countries. Bovo operates the largest food delivery platform globally, but it's also retail and part parts and packages and courier services. And it's across 34 countries, plus the sister companies we have across the different regions. So I always start with stakeholder management from the mission of the company. And if you're lucky to have it, the mission or vision of your particular team or department. So at Glovo, they always said, give everyone easy access to anything in their city. Now, out of either a show of hands or the digital show of hands, how many of you feel like Glovo and any company like Uber Eats literally delivers anything? Couple interactions. I think, I think there are some things we probably can't deliver and don't deliver, right? If you look closely at the statement, they want to give something to everyone. Everyone in my definition of the UX center, I immediately think accessibility, usability. What if I can't use the mobile app? What if I can't call in? What if I can't go downstairs and pick up the package? So this target, this mission of really being able to make the product useful for every single one, can be defined many different ways. This can easy as can anything. And so everything I pushed at the company was trying to get the statement to be more and more true. One of the funniest things about this was anything in your city always became the first thing that we would cut out of scope because we would say we can't deliver from 10 kilometers away or from an hour away or from across the country. Have you, have you ever been to like a large city like London, Paris, LA? These are cities with two airports in them. Sometimes an hour and a half of traffic to drive across Berlin can be like that sometimes. We don't deliver from the other part of the city. It, it doesn't happen. We try to, it's not feasible. So it really becomes a, a matter of like, what exactly do you want the mission statement to be for your team and for the company? What's the promise you're making? And then every idea, every year tries to get us closer and closer to this kind of ideal mission statement. Um, now we had a bunch of layoffs, just like everyone else did. And we had a bunch of budget cuts. So we had a bunch of stakeholders who were like, Hey, I love that you have all these crazy digits to expand scope and add new features, but it's not the right time for us to spend a bunch of extra money. What do you think we can do with lower budgets? So, you know, we had a very dark mindset from some of our stakeholders who said, you know, that's not expensive. I can't guarantee the outcome that's going to have. You want more budget to do this or to try A-B testing for a very long time or a very long research process. Can you show me with certainty the ROI we're going to have, uh, you know? And it's just this mindset that has always been around whenever things have been tough and yet still things have worked out just fine. So we said, we have less budgets. We have stakeholders who are doubting what we can accomplish. They want to just use existing components. They want to use patterns and things that have won in the past. They don't want to try things new. So, so now what, now what do we do? And this is probably the hardest example of stakeholder management because they are not, not fans of your ideas. They simply just don't have confidence. And it's about confidence and trust. And so it's your job then to give them the confidence and trust for the suggestion you're trying to make, for the features you want to build, and for the methodologies or the time you want to take to do research properly or anything in your workflow. So UX is obviously a, a mixture of all of our parts. It's not always represented this way in the company, but as a, as a senior leader, I always try to say UX is what all of us provide for the user. So if I provide a great product experience, but you provide a terrible customer service, the UX is, if I provide a great customer service and a great product, but sales, billing, invoicing is super terrible, the UX is. How many of you have ever tried to call Facebook before? Or Amazon? Or any really large company? <laughs> you kind of just can't do it. Uh, they just, they don't make it super easy. The user experience is terrible. You can have a, a tier one major issue. My account has been hacked. People are running $100,000 ads on my business account. And it will probably take you four to five days to get a text back or an email back from Facebook. I mean, this is part of the user experience, but it's not even in the product. It's not even in your domain. And so really it's a, it's a joint effort. It becomes a bit more like service design, you could say, but it's really the combination of all the departments touch a user that really make up their user experience. So first thing I do is make sure everyone understands that, that they're really, really big one. When I first come to a company, I try to do this in the interview process, but obviously people say lots of things during that process. 
But when you get there, you're like, hey, we need to be able to share the performance of how customer service is doing. What is our return time or our response time on emails, phone calls, texts, WhatsApp complaints, Twitter, whatever way you do customer support. What are the most common things complained about in customer support? Or what are the most reasons why we don't make a sale from our account managers or from our sales team? Those are often the biggest drivers of big wins for UX. The things that made you lose a deal or lose a customer are the things that drove customers crazy enough to call 10,000 times more than they used to last month. Things like this are big indicators of what could be big wins. So let's go through some success stories. I'll try to make this a bit more interactive. So on the left, you have, you have DoorDash, which is mostly in America, Uber Eats, which is all over Europe, and then Pelabot, which is mostly the Middle East. This is the direct competition for, 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 for Glovo. Uber Eats is the biggest one, but we have very stark competition based on the region. And so I try to show like a mixture of competitors. Now, how many of you would pick number one, number two, or number three in terms of the design you preference? You can write it in the chat if you wish. So one is DoorDash, two is Uber Eats in the middle, and three is Talibot on the right. Ones and twos, only a few threes. Interesting. I always like this. Always fun to see. Now, if you can say in one word why you picked your selection, what would it be? Is it the illustrations? Is it the visual balance? Is it the clarity of the text? Is it the navigation? Obviously, this is just from first look, right? So you're not actually interacting with this. This is almost what it would be like if you did a five-second test. Like, you can't actually go and interact with too much. Just on first glance, which one feels more welcoming to you and why or more useful to you and why, you know, categories seem more useful. High priority on making you crave food, visual balance, clarity between sections. Okay, so I love this. Now, this is what the majority of the industry looked like for the last five, six years. This is what I kind of knew to be the industry. And then I got a phone call from Glovo one day. And can you guess what the Glovo app looks like? Do you think it looks the same? Obviously, if you use the app, you might know it doesn't. But their app looks like this. It's a really big thing. We call it the flower. And it just localizes to wherever you are, to whatever you can get. So there's a big anything button because the mission statement is, you know, getting everyone easy access to anything in their city. So the big, biggest button on the screen, the primary action from the home screen was, hey, give, give us a customized request. Go and find the best thing, you know, go to Zara and find two pillowcases that are white and bring it to this Airbnb because they didn't have pillowcases. Please pick up my mail from home and grab the keys off, out of the front desk because I have a friend visiting and she needs to get into the apartment. So like the anything service is literally just like one of our courier employees just running around town fulfilling small requests. And then the courier service was like a package or a box or keys. And then it was whatever services we had like food, snacks, gifts, promotions, retail, drinks, uh, groceries, etc. It's completely different than what you would expect. Not only was it completely radical at the time, it's, they also won't let me, wouldn't let me for two years touch it. They're like, this is how we fulfill the mission. This is perfect UX, Kevin. Nothing could be better. I love stakeholders who love design, but improvement is kind of our whole goal. So from this to this. And I saw one question about what happens when you cannot add any more petals. Right below the screen is a list of, of stores and things like this. And then there was, you're going to cringe at this. There's petals inside of the petals. So if you go into food, it'll be like fast food or premium food. If you go into Super Glovo, it'll say like, you know, butcher shop or like the different sections in the grocery store. If you go to drinks, do you want cold drinks or hot drinks? It was kind of like that Coca-Cola machine where you go and you pick the specific kind of Sprite you want, and then you pick the flavor of Cherry Coke, and then you're. Then you get your drink. But yes, at all inception. And then there's a radically different, although still similar uh, color balance wise approach handled in Asia, where everything was customized with little graphics and not real photos. 
Uh, the West, Europe, North America, North South America really loves photography when they eat food. Menus have a 25% more sell rate if there's a photo of an item in Asia. Actually, the opposite. They did, uh, this is our sister company in Korea. They had a 45 person team of people who did soap carvings and soap carvings for the little characters, the icon, the, the illustration was what they did all day to make people want to click on things. So if something got this kind of soap architecture treatment, soap carving treatment, then it was something that was high priority because it was what people put their eye on and clicked on and bought more often. Really bizarre, in my opinion, until I realized how much they like caricatures in the culture. I mean, Hello Kitty is great and big for a reason. Even with the amount of text on the screen, they're still looking for colorful animated iconography more than anything else. And this is the Mars. This is a motion graphic that made in the same style that you would make uh, the movie Nine or Box. It's like a motion graphic of several movements of a silk figure that they turn into a GIF, which feels like overkill for me. But again, uh, the biggest thing here was they wanted their brand to stand out in the product. In all of their commercials and all of their branding, they always had these animated soap figures. They had their mascot everywhere. Their customer was shown as this kind of androgynous person who really was hungry to eat food. He's dancing with chicken wings. He's, he has, he or she has, you know, food coma. And so the UX team really pitched product on giving brand full cart blanche in the product. So product marketing and brand design constantly pitched new ways to make every mock-up more exciting and more on brand. And then there's like a 70% chance the product design team would actually infuse those ideas. And that was how they shipped the awesome UX, in my opinion. Oftentimes brand design is kind of like an enemy to UX because they, they kind of treat things like everything's a marketing banner or a graphic design. Sometimes it's not the best usability or it's just design system scaling, but this team was embedded directly with them in like touch points, reviews, demos. So the brand design team became an extension of product design, which is a really cool way to get say awesome UX shipped, especially if you like colorful graphics and you have a really strong brand. Tons of interesting people work at Glovo, and this is a photo of every single employee turned into a big Glovo map. And so we said, you know, at the very least, if we're going to be a global brand, this is very similar to what Airbnb did, similar to what Google does for their photography. We should really show multiple kinds of people in all graphics. So we looked at, you know, how do we represent all the different nationalities, the different ages, the different modes of transportation in each country? We have people who deliver food on bikes, on scooters, on Vespas, on steps, on cars and trucks. People are ordering to their girlfriend's house, to their office, to their home, to parks, to boats. So we want it to be like a very lively, animated experience. We wanted people to have, you know, different color skin, different kind of like facial structures and, and different environments that reflected the global landscape of our customer base. And so then, you know, at the beginning, we eventually got fun, awesome UX ships by focusing just on illustration and graphics. As more people bought those things or invested time or in, engaged with features that had this extra treatment, the product team said, Hey, can you do some of those for my product? Or can you do some of those for this new launch or this new country launch or this new feature? Then we would say, we can do more than just illustrations and graphics. We can do more than putting brand storytelling in the product. It would be really nice if we, if we could redesign this entire feature. It's actually not engaging or fun to use. And the graphics are maybe helping tell a story, but they're not helping them learn how to use this feature or learn the product. So we started doing this really interesting concept where we have fake hands in all the screens and the hands would essentially use the product the same way you were going to use the feature. So. You kind of saw a human use the tool or use the feature that you were about to use. And this was something that you would see as you went through an onboarding flow or an explanation or FAQs or a knowledge base. And so essentially you could see yourself doing the same thing the animation was doing, which required us to do hundreds of thousands of hands. And because of us being a Spanish company, this was a really fun thing I learned in the first couple of days working there. No one knew we were Spanish, like in Barcelona, where we have the global headquarters, this is a 5,000 person company, the office is a block and a half, 24 floors. No one knew that we were from Barcelona. No one knew we were from Spain. 
It's the largest tech company in Spain, I think, actually. And it, it was kind of bizarre to me. So we started to influence a lot more local marketing and local design. So from each region of Spain, there's kind of like a design aesthetic, there's a style. So we started to infuse our yellow color plus a local brand kind of motif to do a launch of, uh, in certain cities, to announce new restaurants opening, kind of in- explore the diversity of both the different local markets plus different kind of diversity of design. Even though our aesthetic was very simple and minimal, we kind of played and got a little, little artsy, a little organic for some of the designs. We started to do a bunch of stuff with the hands. And there's more examples of hand stuff. And so the idea kind of came out of, you know, there's so many hands involved in, in making your meals and everything. So this is what it, you would kind of see in the product. Um, and putting together the app ended up becoming a super fun idea that looks like this. I'm going to move on very quickly from the hands and the graphics and some more safe order management stuff, but I just thought this would be super cool to see. Lots of illustrations and little icons. All right, now, let's get down to how we were able to tie this to the business and how we were able to sell it. And this is where all of that sticker management and politics really plays in. So we had a manifesto. Most companies have like some like really old employee handbook or a commission statement for the entire company or business or founder letter. And it really gives reference. So we went back to it, we updated it, and then we wanted to make principles that could be applied to both the physical business, like the operations of our career network, but also to all of our products and digital performance. So some of the ones that came out of this were, we need to have positive impact, local business needs to be digital. So this is focusing on how a lot of small business owners, restaurant owners don't know how to use digital products that need to be helped and then going digital. People didn't trust algorithms. So we wanted the UX so that we helped them on the things that they found confusing or scary. So we put more illustration, more design time in explaining things that were kind of obtuse to them. Like why is the algorithm making me lower my prices or increase my prices or change my radius of delivery? We wanted to really take a stand on social equality. So we made sure that was it with our, all of the UI and the graphics. We made a really big point to change the way we were seen. This is still an ongoing battle, of course, as it is for Uber. We have a thing called the Courier Pledge, which is we guarantee employment rights, insurance, time off, travel benefits, even if you're a contractor or a freelancer. And we needed to brand that. So we own the CourierPledge.com and did all the graphics and UX for that. And then we really wanted to make sure that everything was about relationships and especially local relationships. So we kept localizing uh, both language, content, graphics, and uh, teaching them in a way that was kind of made sense for them. For example, in Morocco, we make 30% of our money um, around two holidays and it's super, super important culturally. And no, in no business would you spend that much time working on one country's one unique holiday that doesn't get shared in other regions you have. But we use that to actually drive the sense of uh, care for the local community and also share that design that can really bring people together. Um, so I'm going to go into what it's like to actually do this. Design is supposed to be a co-creation between design, engineering, and the business. This is what we kept hearing. People said, you know, I expect this to be collaborative. I want decision-making to be fun and fulfilling. We kept referring to large Silicon Valley companies saying that the most innovative companies today put design leaders at the table early on. Uh, these are some quotes from, from my team, you know, when we said, how do we want to make this experience really good? How do we want to make collaboration and getting all of these really great insights and really good projects, you know, the right funding and talent they need. This was some of the things that they were saying. So there's a member of my old team, like up the one named Cassie Cavanaugh. And the first thing that we used to do back then is something that I do now at every company where we go into each individual designer on the team and we go into a skills mapping. How many of you have done a skills mapping for? So, no, a full, a full of people. Okay. So sometimes it can be hard skills. It can be soft skills. It can be specific software. If that's a really goal, a big goal for the company, like pushing the Figma from, from sketch wise. And so these skills mappings really show you where you have gaps in the team. For example, my current team, we have probably 35% of the designers say that they wish they were much stronger at UI and digital design. 
you kind of have these big groups of people who come from graphic design, print design, and they generally have better visual design. And then you have people who were mostly digital in their careers, and maybe they didn't go to a fine arts school or learn color theory or learn balance or contrast, and maybe aren't the strongest with like gestalt principles. And so by doing the skills mapping, we both could see where to invest in certain people's skills growth on certain skills. This was done by peer-to-peer -peer learning, mentoring, giving them opportunities on projects where they could kind of explore that skill or be under a senior or staff or a principal designer who had more of that skill. But also we use this to hire more people with these skills. So these are the skills of the staff, of the team, the users. And then we said, you know, look at some examples of what it takes to, to do skills mapping at other places. So Buffer has a really public article and, and framework about their ideal marketer or a T-shaped marketer. So they prefer generalists who have like one clear focus who go really deep on something. And you can, you can go deep on any of the things, but this is an idea of what it looks like to be a T-shaped marketer with lots of skills, some depth on some, and then an expertise or a passion for one or two. I think things can be done for, for UX. And most managers, designers don't know how they are mapped, nor do they know the thing that they want to work on. And if they've made any progress since last quarter, last year, five years ago, uh, and this is a big area for us to, to convince stakeholders that, hey, you need, you need someone who's like this. This project needs to be led by someone like that. We're going to move this person across to another team or to another project because this is a skill that's required to make this go well. And so this is one level of stakeholder management when it comes to team allocation, budgeting, hiring new people. That was really big. I used this to grow lots of teams where the stakeholders originally said, we don't think we need more designers here. I think we have enough. Our designers aren't doing enough. And it also opened the door for us to do a lot of internal movement. So we were able to move people across teams with like tangible goals for what would happen when they switch teams or join the project. So all about partnerships and people. When it comes to like actually discussing and talking with people, I, I you may have heard of ethos, pathos, logos. So it's like about emotion, logic, and ethics. And it's different ways people understand information. It's different ways people are tend to explain things or convinced of a new idea. Part, which is tied to emotion, is about empathy, empathy principles, values, inspiration. For designers, it's really tied to design principles, the mission statement or a vision of a company or a team. And this is something that you can use to drive and to convince people to do things if it's an important part of how decisions are made on that team or at that company. Sometimes you're dealing with people who are really all about, you know, the moolah, proof, evidence, tangible results. So they care about money. They care about reason, metaphors. They're looking at, has someone else done this really well? Have it worked for them? Can we copy Google? Can we do this? And so they're really focused on that logic, that kind of certainty. And then you have cred or ethics, which is like past experience, trust, strong opinions, and credibility. So. Think about how you can map your stakeholders, either your boss, stakeholders in other departments, and think about how they make decisions, how they rationalize choices, and see if they care or use more emotion, logic, or ethics. Okay, three, just like our users, you want to prime your audience. And this is more about making a big ask or a request, or if you're going into any kind of uh, disagreement. Um, and so I used to work at a small part a company called Book Club. They're like a social media and media streaming platform, turning the content from books by authors into visual media, movies or TV shows, like a series. And so we interviewed the authors of Working Backwards, which are Bill Carr and Colin Breyer, who are some of the earliest executives at Amazon. They've been there for over 30 years. They've only recently left to build this whole foundation and management consulting firm called Working Backwards LLC. No surprise. So this is the whole book and it's about 30 years of insight stories and secrets from inside Amazon, but them are not so secret anymore, particularly some of the frameworks that Amazon uses to run the products team. So if you haven't heard, it's called a PR FAQ, which is a press release and frequently asked questions. You essentially do milestone planning, OKR planning, or kind of visioning work by saying, what are the headlines we want in press, you know? Amazon launches new voice feature that makes shopping a breeze. Uh, be able to order an Uber with just the sound of your voice, things like this. And then imagine working backwards for what features you'd have to build to make that headline a reality. 
and make that headline something that people would actually say out loud to their friends or believe or be shocked by. And so you go through a series of frequently asked questions, you provide answers, solutions, initiatives, or hypotheses, and then you add visuals to all of them to kind of, this is how you would plan a feature before you made any investment or kind of investment from the engineering team, the design team. And this is part of their discovery process before they actually decide to invest further. This might sound a little crazy and a little maybe business case-y, but ironically it works for really small and really big projects. Would you believe that this one pager, this one page PR FAQ is what they use to decide whether or not they would buy Whole Foods? So they said, okay, Amazon, that company from Silicon Valley buys Whole Foods, the world, like the North America's largest organic food supplier, enabling you know, food deserts to be solved, delivery in one day or multiple hours to reach every corner of North America, providing fresh food to everyone. And then they went through a series of FAQs. Why would Amazon buy a grocery store? Why would Amazon deliver groceries in four hours? Why would Amazon go against Uber Eats and DoorDash? And then they had to solve all those questions and then provide a visual for that. And essentially the framework is write a press release, identify customer benefits, so what, what would help the customer? Why would this feature or this headline be interesting to consumers? Define success, answer questions about risk, feasibility, and any issues in five pages or less, and then provide optional mockups or an end to end user journey. Then you go to leadership and this is your pitch. And then once they agree, obviously they cut down some of your scope because you go crazy ideas and then you build. So this is the PR FAQ model. Now, the model breaks down into listen, define, invent, refine, test, and iterate. I won't go through all the questions, but there's a question per, per step. And then the one page, you have to be very concise and answer all these questions. And step one, you have to answer, you know, what do I know about my audience? Whose voices might be missing or excluded? So this is, you know, who are you targeting? And then they ask kind of, who are you leaving out when you target this audience? And then there's questions about, you know, the customers and opportunity in front of you, your proposed solution, and then the other alternatives. So they make you think of alternatives to your own ideas. They make you look at what experience you have and why your experience should make your ideas strong or believable or trustworthy. And then you explain the benefit in the voice of the customer. And then what is your plan to actually test and validate? So all this to say, fair experiences make it easier for users to act quickly. And so you try to make as much of the user experience knowledge, the research knowledge, discovery you have as possible and be in front of discovery. You want them to actually only prioritize discovery for the things you believe would make headlines. Okay. And how am I doing on time? You're good. Well, maybe like 10 more minutes and we can leave a couple minutes at the end for Q&A if you need it. Perfect. Okay. So. One of the things that really works well for people who are logical stakeholders, they really care about numbers, results, they're maybe a bit OKR driven, is trying to tie your ideas directly to a part of the funnel. We kind of generically talk about the funnel or up, lower in the funnel, higher in the funnel. And I feel like people oftentimes don't get specific about what exactly they mean in the funnel. So the pirate funnel or the funnel is generally the steps called R, which is the pirate funnel. So you have awareness, acquisition, activation, retention, revenue, and hopefully, if you're lucky, referral. So generally, a lot of designers work directly on, on areas that are, that are siloed. And so they may be on a team that's directly tied to activation. Maybe they're working on new customers, onboarding. Maybe they're doing new product development, a lot of launches. And so you oftentimes maybe get to focus on just one area or two areas, but not the entire end to end, depending on the size of your team and the company. Now, based on the company structure, this can be resolved a couple of different ways. When you're working on a centralized team, it's a lot easier to influence stakeholders because you maybe work directly with the designers, researchers, product managers who cover a very large scope, multiple products, multiple features. But as you work on decentralized satellite teams, deeply embedded teams that maybe you kind of had the custom and unique way of working, it's very common that you need to learn a very different stakeholder management style when asking for support or getting dependencies across the line from other departments, other teams, 
who maybe aren't aware of what your needs are or don't see why, you know, them being two weeks late is going to somehow ruin your, your user experience or for the Frankenstein release. And this is where you remind them that UX is a joint effort by everyone. So if I ship early and you ship this feature four weeks late, they're going to come into a thinking about experience. They're going to have to learn and adapt to an experience that we didn't design just based on what got it out the door. And then they're going to have to get used to it again when you make changes. And if this is how the whole release goes for all the teams, it's just kind of like chasing a horse. They will always be experiencing not an ideal or not a designed experience. And they're just never going to have the best user experience. So, uh, often activation and retention are strongly linked. So the first time a user tries a new feature, uses, you know, a, a changed feature, this is your product. It has immense value and generally dictates how they see the product, the feature, or the whole company. And so trying to retain them as you make constant changes, as they have really bad experiences or exposure to MVPs, version ones, version zeros really dictates how much of a retention model you're going to have out of the cohort of users who have that bad or subpar first experience. So, and then just to, to wrap up, one of the things that I like to do to make sure that this knowledge and this, this insight from how to manage stakeholders isn't just kept at the management level or whoever comes to one of my talks, um, I recommend checking out any public resource that I made which is I made the entire job description and the skills mapping requirements for each level within UX, motion design, graphic design, UX research, and content writing public for global. So it's 85 different roles from an intern level all the way to senior director. This is obviously a very strong internal personal opinion of what these levels would be, but it's good, let's say, inspiration for you if you want to modify it and mix it up for your needs. So this is the link that I will put in the ch well, well, that progression app com, And then you can kind of look at what it takes and the descriptions I gave for each of the hard skills, soft skills, management skills, things like this for each level within UX, content design, research, all the different roles that I used to manage. And then a big shout out to progression app because they make this super easy. And that skills mapping exercise is actually built into the product and you can see customers uh, so you can see you know, your team grow year over year, week over week, quarter over quarter. And it's like an actual model to actually enforce some of the stakeholder management skills, as well as all the skills required to be better than. So, it's time for questions. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for giving us a little bit of behind the scenes of what's happened, what you were doing at Globo, and then also kind of talking about how that translated into the stakeholder. We have a couple of questions uh, here in the chat, but feel free to continue to submit them. I put the link in the chat. Maybe Jeff can put that again. You can also upvote questions that you want um, to hear answers to as well. But we'll start off here where there's one a bit about like specifically convincing stakeholders with research. So it right. says how to convince stakeholders to, UX, to use UX research before started to think about having a new feature. Most of the time they come to UX research after they've decided on a feature and just asked to test that. So kind of like getting stakeholder buy-in maybe like before the ideas features already made them. Any thoughts on this or suggestions? Yeah, certainly. I think this is one of the, the really large struggle people have, uh, companies have, is trying to get research to be ahead of design. In general, getting product to be ahead of design because design always feels like it's very really rushed. So research is supposed to be, in my opinion, the tool to get that. If you are conducting research, you oftentimes come across information or insights that are not directly relevant to, let's say, the goal of the research. And I call this the cutting room floor, cutting, cutting room floor insights. So we had a bunch of researchers complain to us one day that they're like, hey, we're going through our transcripts. We love the research we got. We got a lot of interesting things we can do with this, but we actually got a bunch of comments about another feature or, or a change we recently made. What do we do with this information? And so the way you manage your, your research repository, the way you manage your transcripts is a really big uh, part of this. We actually exposed directly, and this is not always favorite in the industry, the PMs uh, to this. So we said, you conduct your own research, record everything. We have the transcripts, we have AI going through the transcripts, we used a combination of dovetail and, and rally to actually kind of pull up insights 
from all the different falls, all the different notes. And this kind of gave us a forward looking roadmap of, hey, there might be some growing issues that are lingering that are getting missioned by more and more customers or they talk to them. And maybe this is what we should do for Q1 or Q2 or Q3. So it kind of proactively started to make, you know, the design team get ahead of everything. They get access to these insights quite early. PM is aware of it. And then it may be influenced with the roadmap a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So like really looking at the patterns that are happening over time and kind of trying to get ahead of it in a way and using and, and talking about how this is something that we've been seeing. So it's not the tracking of it almost in a way as well. Exactly. Usually by the time we internally see something, the customers have already been feeling it. And if, you know, there's a kind of, you know, the, the dodge, like it only takes five customers to find, to find a problem. Well, if you've already had five people complain about it, I'm sure thousands have this problem. Yeah. Okay. We also have a question about the revamp that you did with like the Glove app or Glovo app of like, how did you influence stakeholders to revamp it? It looked like a huge change. Was this something that was kind of you guys were pushing or was it something that was kind of put on you in a way? I love this question. So I have a visual for this. It's a bit frustrating of a project, as you can imagine. It's a very hard thing to get large, successful multi-million dollar companies, multi-billion dollar companies to make changes. So there was this concept of MVPs. I'm sure multiple people have this problem where people still think MVPs are like the bare minimum, bare bone thing. That doesn't work for redesigns. It really doesn't work for redesigns when your, your 10% of an AV test is 45 million customers. You can't really piss off many customers redesigning their entire app that they use two times a day. So we said, you know, the MVP of all these changes in this redesign and, and, and then this big, these big changes have to include very strong UX. And by UX, I mean, it needs to be fun to use because that's one of our brand elements. It needs to be usable and it still needs to be reliable. So like fix the binds, do the, do the traditional QA, but also design is going to do QA. Design says, no, it doesn't go out. Then, okay. I didn't mention rally. Let's skip this part. Then we did a couple of extra requirements for large changes, for redesigns, for, for example, changing the font in the app, changing the home screen, uh, adding a new feature like a loyalty system or a loyalty program. We needed to make sure that we did super localized testing. Generally in research, you just hope you get a diverse audience. We actually said, let's do one test in Nigeria, one test in Egypt, one in Bulgaria, one in Germany, one in Spain, one in South America, one in Korea, one in Australia. And so you got very different results and you kind of single selected the mixture you wanted and you saw very, very unhappy results from some markets, some languages, some regions, and then we were able to dig a bit deeper into that. We also made our research playbook super public so people could see why and how we were making decisions. Oftentimes stakeholders thought that getting on one phone call a week was user research and they're like, and a really loud customer coming complain about this. So we must fix this now. And it's like. Have you looked at the definition of statistical significance? And have you looked at the fact that you talked to a thousand customers in the last 30 days and they disagree with your comment? And so they just never saw the process documented and they just would believe or trust us. This helped a lot for that belief and that trust. I'm going to show one more thing. We did a lot of QX scoring, which I don't have a particular thing about whether you should or shouldn't do it. But the, the biggest thing we did was getting them direct access to advisory boards, which are like permanent-ish focus groups of customers from each segment that you're focusing on for the next, let's say, one year or two years, based on how far you do planning. Uber Eats has one, Airbnb has one, DoorDash has one, and you actually ask them their feedback on policy changes, on UX changes. But this is kind of like those beta groups, but instead of it being a random selection of people who say, yes, I'm willing to be in a beta, we like cherry-picked users who represented you know, discount shoppers, super users, and things like this from different regions. And we made them the first test group for everything that impacted. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Love that you just have those slides <laughs> to uh, pull up. And I also love, I've seen that like idea of the MVP represented with those triangles before where it's like, it's this like little sliver of everything. And I think it's a really nice way to kind of show how the differences of sometimes what people think of. The MVP as well. 
We have a question here from a junior designer who wants to know, how would you recommend talking to people who are higher up in the company when you disagree with their plans on the products? How do you gain credibility? Yes. Okay, so this is always fun. But it really depends on your ceremonies. So, for example, a lot of times people think they talk like this because of the user experience. And I have to say that I've always talked like this, which is scary, probably. Because this is probably talking to my stakeholders, say I talk to the CEO of my company, this is I talk to the CTOs and, and the users. Obviously, with a bit more of an inquisitive approach to my question or to my statement. So, why do you do this? Or have you considered trying this and trying to remove some of the bias? But there is often time. Sometimes you have very direct managers of stakeholders who explicitly request something or they ask, but they don't really need it as a question. And I think the best way to kind of prove them wrong and or change their mindset is to figure out whether they're someone who's emotional or they're reacting to a demand or a request from someone that they respect or from a user or a client base or an audience that have lots of money, like this customer represents 2% of revenue, ask for the thing, you have to do it. And just figure out what motivates them, what language they're speaking, and then use that when speaking to them, when you're pitching for a change. Uh, I can't as quickly pull up this document probably, but I have an entire document of what I did at booking.com to influence stakeholders. And essentially I put together a presentation that these are the goals you have. These are the KPIs you have. These are the OKRs you have. This is our competition. If you do care about these things, then I think, you know, here's 16 really rough ideas of what you, what you should do. And with a combination of screenshots, whoever did it best, or very quick, very quick one or two page mockups of what I think it should look like if we did it. Now, you gotta find time to do all that work. Uh, you don't always do that, so pick your battles, but it was a really helpful technique for managing it. Yeah, I love that. Also, I think visuals, you know, can be super powerful when trying to kind of show people things as well. And hopefully we have some of those skills. And so we're not all visual designers, but, you know, utilizing some of the, the skills that we have in there as well. Yeah. I'm just going to pick one, one last question to kind of wrap up. Also, yeah, I'm just running through them. There's a question in here about kind of, and you, you talked about this a little bit, the connect the relationship with PMs and kind of how do you convince or work with PMs about like when they only want to try competitors in new ways or like when you're kind of working kind of talk about this relationship about when you're maybe on not such or you're maybe on a little even playing field or it's not so much like a C level but how do you kind of work with that dynamic as well I think it's super clear that there's a really good definition of the roles for first. Sometimes it's, it's not to be very formal. It can be an agreement in one designer and one PM, but if your product is multi-team or it covers a large scope and there's multiple engineering teams being managed to achieve each kind of release, then it makes more sense to kind of find that either for the entire group under a GPM or for the entire product organization. So. Oftentimes this becomes like a racing. So it's like responsibilities, accountabilities, who's consulted, who's informed. Even that doesn't always solve the problem. I usually try to agree on, you know, do we do demos every two weeks and is design in those demos and does design have the authority to actually raise a blocking change or reject a PR because something in design was not done or executed properly. That's a big one. Second, do you want designers in discovery or do you go, are you planning on doing PM discovery, and then design discovery, and then execution. If you're going to do all three of those steps, how much time do you think each of those is going to take? And have you left enough time for that? And then I also do a series of things like, who do you expect to be in the Figma file? This is also a fun one. Because it talks to whether or not your PMs or your stakeholders are planning on actually editing, leaving comments, directly influencing design as design is in progress and happening. And Generally, based on the answer, I make a couple of different process changes so that designers can do peer reviews, internal safe space reviews before they get access or feedback from PMs, GPMs, CPOs, CEOs, things like this. Um, thanks for getting a little bit into that nitty gritty of that as well, kind of how you're working with them. But thank you so much for kind of sharing your expertise and your experience uh, with these subject matters. If people want to get in touch with you, 
I, I know you're very easy to just reach out to a LinkedIn for me. Uh, and you're also in our, in the Slack group. So if you want to kind of continue these conversations or have some more specific questions that didn't get answered, I know Kevin will be happy to kind of continue these conversations. Throw in some links in the chat right now as well. Um, I also saw uh, a note there. Um, Kevin did mention that he'll be happy to share some of his slides with us as well. And so we'll get those to you at a later date um, through our newsletter, which you'll get an email after uh, this talk uh, from Luma. So that's if you're not signed up for it already, you can put it there and we'll get you um, some of his slides at a later date too. So thank you again. Big uh, round of applause from all of us here. I just have a couple more slides I'll throw up um, as we finish off for the day. I wanted to just mention our next meetup, our last meetup of the year is December 13th with Maria Karnakova, and she is a senior design ops, and she's going to be doing a wonderful talk of the differences between, and some, like, the differences of design ops versus design managing, kind of looking at those two nuances and seeing the differences there. So if you're kind of wondering what design ops is and want to know more about it, I suggest coming out. We have one more course at the Fountain Institute this year. It starts November 27th. It's Designing Product Experiments. So if you kind of want to find out some more information about how to test your ideas in the discovery phase or in the delivery phase, please uh, sign up for that. We have a couple spots left. As I mentioned, if you want to join uh, the Guild of Working Designers, you can apply. Um, it's at bit.ly backslash Guild of Working Designers, or you can use this uh, QR code to join and apply there. But other than that, a reminder of the Fountain Institute, our vision is a world that seeks designers for the way that they think, not just what they produce. Really lovely talk today. Excited to see all of y'all, and we'll see you next month for a meetup. So thanks. Been, been a lovely time. Bye, everyone. Thank you.